This podcast is part one of two on the subject of super recognition. It follows up in an article published in the spring 2020 issue of the HDI Act Journal titled Capitalizing on the Super Recognition Advantage, a powerful but underutilized tool for policing and national security agencies. The HDI Journal can be found at our website, www.hdiac.org. Hello, and welcome to today's HDI Act podcast. HDI Act is one of three information analysis center, basic centers of operations, sponsored by the Defense Technical Information Center. These centers cover a wide variety of technical focus areas that are of importance to the Department of Defense. They provide users with focused technical consulting and unbiased scientific and technical information through in-depth analysis and product creation. My name is Dirk Plant, and I am the Deputy Director at the HDI Act. For today's podcast, I will be joined by Dr. Josh Davis and Dr. David Robertson to discuss the science of super recognition. Dr. Davis is a reader in applied psychology at the University of Greenwich. His PhD was on the forensic identification of unfamiliar faces in CCTV images. And he has since published research on human face recognition and eyewitness identification, the reliability of facial composite systems, and methods used by expert witnesses to provide evidence of identification in court. He's a member of the Experimental Psychology Society and the British Psychological Society. He regularly features in the international media, including the United Kingdom, the United States, Denmark, Brazil, Germany, and Hong Kong. His first co-edited book, titled Forensic Facial Identification, Theory and Practice of Identification from Eyewitnesses, Composites, and CCTV was published in 2015. Dr. Robertson is a lecturer in psychology at the University of Strathclyde School of Psychological Sciences and Health. He completed his PhD at the University of College London's Institute of Cognitive Neuroscience before going on to work as a postdoctoral researcher. He joined the University of Strathclyde in 2017, where he established the Strathclyde Applied Cognitive Psychology Lab, which focuses on applied face recognition research. He has published several scientific papers on individual differences in facial recognition ability and the detection of emerging face-based identity fraud techniques. He has presented this research at national and international conferences to both academic and practitioner audiences including the United Kingdom Home Office and Europol. To begin with, David, can you just describe typical facial recognition technology? Hi, Dirk. Uh, Many thanks for uh, the opportunity to do this. I've had the pleasure of working with HDIAC for around about three years now, and it's always a pleasure to work with you and your team. So thank you for for the the chance to do this. Um, So to to start with, um, both myself and Josh, our research interests um, focus around applied facial recognition context. That is, where where do we use face recognition in society across security critical um, situations, and how can we improve that? process. Um, Now, in modern society, facial recognition is a ubiquitous part of uh, procedures. Uh, We see it everywhere. And particularly in security critical uh, contexts, such as national security, the criminal justice system, one of the key tasks that we have to do in those roles is to authenticate uh, a target or a suspect, our ability to authenticate their identity. And despite the growth of other biometrics, uh, such as, uh, you know, fingerprints and passports or iris scans, the face remains the most widely used um, stimuli for the recognition and the authentication of an individual's identity. So in national security operations, one might have to match a suspect or a target's face to stored or live CCTV images at border control. An officer is required to match the face of a traveller to the face photo on their passport document. And in each case, it's critical that they make the correct judgment, because if not, an investigation could lead uh, in the wrong direction or an individual with a fraudulent passport could enter into the country. So at this moment in time, facial recognition is a ubiquitous part of society. 
It's involved in key security critical operations. And the most important thing is that we make accurate decisions in these situations. However, research over the last 10 years has shown that the human ability to accurately identify unfamiliar faces, that is people that we might not have encountered before, is actually pretty poor. So while we as humans think that we're good at recognizing family, friends and colleagues, that ability doesn't generalize to the unfamiliar domain. The person at border control is unfamiliar with the face of the traveler. The person in the national security operation may just have encountered the target through images. And when it comes to matching photos or a face to a photo of a person that we're unfamiliar with, error rates can be around about as high as, as 10 to 20 percent on average and that's unacceptable in security critical um, situations so that would be the present state of the art at the moment um, i focus largely on human face recognition um, but the same applies to automated systems and that they struggle with the same things that humans tend to struggle with when it comes to identifying faces which can be highly variable across time great thank you um, so your article focuses on super recognizers individuals who appear to show exceptional face recognition skills. Josh, could you tell us how you define super recognition? Okay, well, th well th thank you too for inviting me to, to this podcast. Um, so how can we define super recognition? Well, we know that there are large individual differences in face recognition ability in the population. Um, and we know from most sort of physiological and psychological processes that you have a sort of normal distribution. If, if you go back to your school days, you might remember uh, learning about bell-shaped curves and, and, and things like this. So, so what, what we know from that is that most people form somewhere generally in the middle, but super recognizers at the very top end of the scale and what we call people with prosopagnosia, developmental prosopagnosics, are right at the very bottom end of the scale. I mean, as a sort of um, arbitrary cutoff point for both, we suggest about 10% of the population uh, perform in that particular range. So that's how we define super recognition. Um, there are different ways of measuring it, though, and to some extent, it depends on the particular task that an uh, organization might want. But most of the research that's been conducted so far in this domain uh, has been using very short term face memory tests, whereby over a period of a few minutes, you are familiarized with faces, you learn these faces, and the people scoring in the top 2%, they're the people defined as super recognized. Mm -hmm. Uh, for specific job roles, though, it may be that, as, as David previously said, that, um, uh, I say, at border control, you need people who are very good at deciding whether the face on a passport or an identity document is the same as the person holding it. We know that that is a slightly different skill. It's called simultaneous face matching. And what we really want is people who are good at both the short term memory skills and the simultaneous face matching. And it may be that uh, for specific roles, you may you may want job specific tests on top of those two critical tests to define super recognizers. So you'd probably want them to score in the top two percent on a simultaneous face matching test and a short term face memory test. And when we talk about a person being a super recognizer, what makes a person more or less likely to possess that ability? Well, Josh just touched a moment ago on the idea of facial recognition being an individual difference uh, along a bell shaped curve. And it's one of the cognitive abilities that we think has a high degree of genetic predisposition. And what I mean by that is you're either born uh, to be good at face recognition with good face recognition skills or not. And in, in that respect, it's much like singing ability. There are those individuals like myself who can't sing, who wish they could. The majority of the population in the middle who are reasonable singers, who may sing in the shower. And then at the top end, you have the number one artists. Well, we think the same thing applies to 
face recognition. And as Josh, Josh touched on there, that continuum lies from individuals with prosopic agnosia who have trouble recognizing friends and family, the typical recognizers who make up the majority of the population, and those at the top end are super recognizers who really excel at this task. Now, what research has shown us in terms of how an individual may be categorised um, as a super recognizer is firstly that genetic component. You know, it's an individual difference. The second most important point is it doesn't appear that we can train people to be better at face recognition. So if you took myself, for example, a typical recognizer, we across uh, a lot of different research groups over the last 10, 15 years have tried a variety of cognitive techniques to try and improve people's unfamiliar face recognition ability using things like border control or security operations as templates. And we've just not been able to do it as effectively as we would, we would like because the individual differences are so large, you may get an improvement of 10%, but if the individual's at 60% accuracy, then that still falls a long way short from where we would like to be. So the first two points are that it doesn't appear, if the first two points are that it's an individual difference, something that we're born at, there is really good research to support that, but also the fact that we can't train individuals who are typical recognisers to be better. But what we can do, because there are these large individual differences, is select those at the top end, these super recognisers, um, in order to, to support facial recognition tasks. Now, in terms of what else kind of categorises them, it's a genetic you know, there's a genetic predisposition to the ability, but it also appears as if it's face specific. So interestingly, if you recruit a, a super recognizer, it's not likely that that individual will be, will show an across the board enhancement in cognition and perception. They're not likely to be better at car recognition or verbal memory or other types of non-face tasks. So here we have an individual who's genetically predisposition to be good with faces. We can't train people at present to reach their level of ability. And those super recognizers that we can select, they have a very specific ability for faces that doesn't appear in other cognitive domains. Josh, in the article you point out that you have worked with such individuals uh, in London's Met Forces. Can you tell us some more about that? Yes, uh, when the first research on super recognizers was being conducted actually in Harvard University in the United States, uh, I started getting involved with the Metropolitan Police um, and they just set up a brand new uh, what they called caught on camera website. And on that website, they would be posting images of wanted criminals, fugitives. Uh, and what they found was it was a very it was the same very small group of about 20, 25 police officers who were making quite a substantial minority of all the identifications. And when you, when you think there are about 30,000 police officers in the Metropolitan Police in London, as you can imagine, 20 doing this was quite surprising. So we, got, so we agreed to do some testing of these people uh, and we found some of them uh, were, well, they, most of them were in this 2% super recognizer range, some of them, you know, even higher than that. Very shortly afterwards, uh, London had hideous riots uh, going on in, in 2011. And the people that we'd identified as being very good identified about 600 rioters. Uh, from CCTV footage, often grainy, as you can imagine, uh, most of the cameras are on poles, it's not very good quality, but they managed to sort of track through the CCTV fields of view, people who were sort of throwing bricks at the police or, or you know, causing criminal damage or, or theft or other robbery, and then working out when they perhaps took their disguises off ah, this is the person we want to identify. And it was then that Super recognised going, well, you know, I reckon I arrested that guy five years ago, or I think I've seen him as an associate of someone I've, I've <laughs> arrested many years ago. And they were recognising people that they hadn't seen for a long time, as I said, in pretty poor quality images. So that was the first step. And then we did some more testing for them. And they set up, uh, the Metropolitan Police set up a full-time unit. Uh, at some one time, it was staffed by seven different people. And they were all super recognised as selected by the type of tests I mentioned earlier. Uh, and pretty quickly, they made thousands of identifications of suspects, mainly from cold cases where they could 
go through old CCTV footage and go, ah, oh, I see this guy in this image. I've seen him in another image. They don't actually, they, they don't know that person. They've never seen them before in their life, except for in CCTV footage. And they were sort of building up portfolios of evidence. There was a couple of cases where there were more than 30 different crimes. They managed to match the same offender. In those cases, because of course they didn't know who they were, they would, um, you know, post the images on in the, in the local media and things like that. And then, you know, a member of the public would identify them and then that person would be arrested and they would sort of, you know, go to court. And some of them went to prison for very long periods of time for the sort of severity of the crime that they took. Um, and we've done the same with other police forces as well. I've got um, I've been working with uh, Munich uh, police in, in, in Germany and, and Stuttgart. And in fact, we've got. Um, uh, Frankfurt and the uh, German Federal Police starting in a couple of weeks and also Queensland in Australia, Singapore Police and a couple of others that I'm not actually allowed to say anything about. Uh, so I'll, I have to keep my lips sealed for that one. But in all cases, they, they, the aim was to set up small units, much smaller than London, because these are small police forces um, and sometimes just manned by one or two people to deal with footage when and where it comes in, to try to identify those suspects and to match up as well and to do other tasks. I mean, at uh, Munich and in London, uh, Munich has Oktoberfest, which is a huge beer festival for two weeks. A quarter of a million people go every single day. And as you can imagine, with a little bit of alcohol, there's always a bit of crime. And the super recognisers on in their police are sort of on, on the gateways going into the festival and on the CCTV footage to look out for people who've caused trouble in the past so they can stop them coming in. So what tools would an organisation use to identify their super recognisers? Uh, well, so the, the, t the type of tests that we have been using, for instance, if I go back to, to Munich, police because it was relatively recently um, the police force invited all of their officers and other staff who aren't sort of police officers as such to see if they'd like to have a go at the tests we we put the type of test I mentioned earlier on on a website so that they could all have a go there were a series of uh, uh, eight or nine different tests that they had to take all measuring slightly different aspects of face recognition because they had some specific needs and the, the faces um, varied in age, for instance, and they also varied in ethnicity because we know that people tend to be better at recognising the ethnicity of faces they are more familiar with, but, you know, they come into contact with and perhaps ethnicities that they, they don't know so well. Um, so, so we had a wide range of tests. We also looked at uh, sort of a longer term memory of um, face recognition as well. Uh, and then at the end, the highest scorers were invited down to uh, examination sessions where we gave them some additional tests and also did some sort of training and understanding. Uh, I give lectures on, you know, how the Metropolitan Police used their super recognizers and things like that. So it was so they get an understanding of perhaps the type of tactics that they could use in their police force. Uh, and and I, I do know within within three months of the um, the unit of, of two in Munich being set up, actually, they'd, they'd identified about 200 wanted criminals from CCTV. And um, Germany doesn't have much CCTV. So they, they believe that was a really good success. And they were surprised. And in fact, one of the reasons we're working with other German police forces is they would go, wow, this is far back more successful than we ever imagined. This has been part one of the Super Recognizer podcast. Thank you for viewing it. The conversation with Drs. Davis and Robertson continues in part two of this podcast series, which can be found on the HDI website at www.hdiac.org.